Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so when Jesus here is quoting, you have heard it said, he's quoting pretty much the law. He's quoting Moses in most cases. And in this, he says, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. So everything that he says, when he speaks of you shall not hate, right? Or you, you, uh, you shall not kill, right? You shall not commit adultery and, you, uh, and do not take a false oath. He's not saying don't pay attention to these anymore. He's saying these still hold. Now let me tell you what else that means and how it is that you are to live. More than just the minimum, let me increase it. Let me increase its intensity because all of these need to go down to the root, to where these things, right, murder, adultery, and having to somehow, or being tempted to take a false oath, would somehow, uh, what the root is. And so Jesus says, I did not come to toss away the law, but to fulfill it. He says, in fact, not even a little bit of it will be uh, erased, but it will be fulfilled. And there's an important thing here, because... uh, there's kind of this popular idea in sort of pastel American Christianity, (laughs) right? I don't know what you call it, but sort of soft American Christianity, that what happened is, is Jesus came to throw out the law and to just give us sincerity of heart, right? That's completely false. It's also true, it's also the case that sometimes we, we get the idea, we get the impression, or sometimes we assume without thinking about it too much, that, um, that Jesus came, he first God promised to the Jews. But then when Jesus came, he, God didn't need the Jews anymore because now we have Jesus. That's also a heresy, right? God fulfills his promise to Abraham in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is not the replacement of Abraham. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And so everything God promised to the Jewish people, and Jesus is a Jew, right, is fulfilled, sustained, and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's brought to completion. This is why in the early church fathers, when we hear that as where before God revealed in the Old Testament, what we have is a shadow. When you have a shadow cast, you have an outline for something, right? You can kind of see what it is based upon the shadow. And so that shadow shows us something of the shape of God whom we worship. And yet Jesus comes to fulfill that. So now what we have is not the shadow, but the one whose shadow was previously seen. Now you can see God in the face in the person of Jesus Christ, not just the shadow that he casts that give you an idea of what the face of God is like. No, now you can, as Jesus said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus comes to fulfill God's promise to Abraham, to fulfill everything he spoke through the Jews, everything he spoke in the law and the writings and the prophets. So Jesus did not come to toss anything out. So you hear us saying once in a while, oh, well, that's Old Testament stuff. We're New Testament now. Yes, that's right. Old Testament stuff still holds, but it's completed in the New Testament. So you have some of the rules and the laws which were given, because there's different kinds of laws. There's the law given by God that is the moral law, and that is the law of what God intended. It's, it's creation as God created it, what is true as God created it. And then there is, after, um, after the people of Israel really uh, abandoned God and, and Moses was then sent to them and then they followed him, they trusted him to lead him out, there was still that contentious relationship. And so what happened in many cases is Moses had to make rules or laws which were an accommodation. That is, that it's not what God intended, but it's not as bad as what you'll do. It's a, it's a media, it's a, it's a partway evil. It's a stopgap that if we allow the people, if we make a law that you can go this far, but not further, then at least we avoid the worst of what will happen 
if you're trying to be held to what it is that God demands. And so Jesus talks about that. He references it here. But Jesus talks about that in, in regards to divorce, right? A lot of the Pharisees approach Jesus and say, you said, right? Moses said, uh, if a man divorces his wife, he's to give her a decree of divorce. And Jesus, his response was, well, Moses told you that because of the hardness of your heart which is basically saying, that's not what God wanted, but that's the rule that Moses gave you so that things didn't get worse. And what was the worse? And that is that there would, that in, instead of divorce and remarriage, where you somehow maintain kind of what a family is, right? You, you have some idea of what a family is. Instead, there would be sort of a serial adultery and even murder of wife, which was something that in those days was, I remember, they're sacrificing things to gods and temples. They're having all kinds of wars uh, between tribes. So to, to say, I'm tired of this wife, I want a new one, to kill the old wife so that you can marry the new one is worse. So Moses says, let's give you this law so that we don't end up in murder and constant the acceptance of serial adultery. And so what Jesus says is, this is the rule that God, this is the rule that Moses gave because of the hardness of your heart. But in the beginning, he says, it was not so. So Jesus then comes to fulfill the law, to bring the law back to its fullness, instead of just the law that Moses had given, which was as much as the people could handle at that point. And what is this then? Because as Paul says, you know, we couldn't just keep all of the law. We could try, but we couldn't totally keep all of the law. We fall short. But Jesus comes to say, I give you myself. Jesus is the law in person. And he gives us his Holy Spirit and he gives us himself that it is Christ who lives the law out in us. Right? As St. Paul says, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's not because the laws are irrelevant and all I need is sincerity of heart with Jesus. That's because in order to fulfill the, in order for the law to be fulfilled in my life and the way I live it, I need Jesus. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his Mere Christianity book. He says, you know, God's not interested in anything other than perfection. And he says, you know, sometimes we say, oh, you know, the, what Jesus teaches or what, what God teaches us, it, it's somehow too much. How can I do that? And C.S. Lewis says, that's the point. <laughs> right? You are supposed to hear what God commands, try to do it and fail and say, I can't do this on my own God. I need your help. And that's where C.S. Lewis says that when you surrender to God and say, what you command is too much for me. I need your help. That is when Christ begins to live it out in you. And that is when perfection becomes possible, not because of you, but because of God's grace. So it is this point of not compromising on the law, but living out the law of God in such a way where we come to the, we, we're confronted with our weaknesses and our limitations, and we cry out to God for help, and he begins to live it out in us. So it is the spirit of God, it is Christ who lives out the law in us. And so he's teaching today just a few things of what this, what this is. Uh, I'll just go to the end because this is, there's so much in here, right? There's books written on this, but I won't give a book today. <laughs> uh, but at the end here where he says, do not take a false oath, but make good to the Lord all that you vow. So he says, you've heard that said, but he says, now I say to you, I'm here to fulfill what was said. I'm here to deepen it. So he says, I say to you, do not swear at all. Not by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by earth, nor by Jerusalem, nor by your own head. What is he saying here? To take, he says, avoid taking a false oath, fulfill your vow. He says, but do not swear at all. What's a swear? If I say, if I say, I will show up tomorrow. I'll meet you tomorrow at such and such a place. And you say to yourself, oh, okay, I'm not sure I believe you. So I say, okay, I swear it. 
I swear I'll be there. Why do I have to do that? Is because there's doubt, there's tension, and there is not only the reality of a possibility of a lie, right? If, if there was no possibility of a lie, nobody would have to swear anything. But there's not only the possibility of a lie, but there's doubt between you and me that you think that I would do that. And Jesus says, don't go there. Don't go there. When you say yes, mean yes and do yes. And when you say no, mean no and do no. Let your actions follow through with that. No need to try to coerce somebody to believe you. Just say and do. So this has nothing to do with sort of getting away with promise or, or getting rid of promises. We make promises to God because Ultimately, because we love him. To promise, as people do in marriage, promise to one another, or as, as I do as a priest, to promise my life to God, right? That promise is not going against what Jesus says here because I'm not trying to coerce or convince God. And in the formation that we receive, the church helps us to understand that I'm not trying to coerce or convince God or myself but that opened up and being vulnerable to God about my, not only my strengths, but my weaknesses, my limitations, I make a promise to God which relies upon his help for me to fulfill. Uh, G.K. Chesterton and others have talked about that this, lovers naturally promise the moon, <laughs> right? Lovers are just compelled to promise to one another, but what are they promising? Are they promising something in the future? Are they promising that something will come about? Are they promising some course of events? Are they trying to predict? No, they're promising themselves. They're saying, I don't know what tomorrow will be like. I don't know what the weather will be. I don't know what the economy will be. I don't know how much capacity I will have. But I tell you this, with all of me, I promise I will do this Toward you. This is how I will act toward you. This is my word and I will keep it. It's not a coercion. It's not a, an attempt to, to try to overcome disbelief. It's a love that already exists. A love that is already there is inclined to say, I want to promise myself to you. G.K. Chesterton talks about this as one who is inclined, lovers are inclined, naturally inclined to make promises and these uh, promises are basically a surrender of a freedom of choice to do other things. That what I really want, what, where my happiness really is, is not in having more choices or not even in having an opportunity to change my mind later, but by saying that with God's help and because God is faithful, I promise this is how I, will, how I will act toward you. What the future is, God only knows. He holds that in his hands. And what capacity I have is what I receive from God. But what I do with that, what I do with my freedom, is how I can give both to God and to others. And a promise has to do with who I say I am and I will be, the shape of my life. And so in love, people naturally promise to throw away certain freedoms or choices in order to focus on the lover, in order to focus on the one who is loved. And so this is a promise. And it's not a way, a promise should not be something to say, well, Right? And we do this sometimes. I hear this a lot in spiritual direction, the confessional, whatever. It's like we're, we're trying to avoid a sin and we're trying to do this good thing like for Lent. And so we, what we're, our technique is to tighten down the screws and just try harder, right? I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna restrict myself in order to fulfill this promise. But if the promise is not in accord with our nature or who we are, then it becomes difficult to do and it becomes a constriction in the spiritual life. So while promises have to do with getting rid of choices and focusing, 
they don't have to do with somehow pushing down your human nature. They have to do with recognizing your human nature, both strengths and weaknesses, what it is, and then how it is that you are set free in that nature to be what God intends. And that is to be somebody who can love as he loves. And so lovers make promises. There are certain things that God gives to us and that we can do with. There are other things that do not belong to us. So in here, Jesus says, do not swear, not by heaven. So if I make a, if I, if I swear by heaven to try to convince somebody, do I, do I have any authority over heaven? I mean, can I possess heaven? Can, can I say, I'll swear by heaven? All right, give me heaven. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I don't have it, right? So I, I can't, it's not mine. It's not mine to give, it's not mine to take, it's not mine to swear by. It could be God's gift, but it's not something we possess. So he says, nor by the earth, so we don't possess the earth, it's given. Not by Jerusalem, for it belongs to God, it's the king's city. And he says, you shall not swear by your head. That's an interesting one, huh? But that's what it means. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Anybody ever do that in the playground? Right? That's swearing by your head. That's saying if I don't keep my promise, basically may my heart be cut in four pieces and my eyes be poked out. That's what that, and that, that's a way to, uh, uh, to make a, a vow. But if we're trying to use it to coerce, the Lord says don't do that. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no. So he says don't swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. Now, with your freedom, you can give yourself. You can say, I give my person to you in this promise. Because even though I can't control the future, I can, hopefully, control me enough to say what I will do. That's a promise. But here, if we swear by your head, if, if we don't own heaven, we don't own the earth, and we don't own Jerusalem, Jesus is also saying, you don't own your head. You don't even own your hair. Can't make a single hair white or black. There are certain things God gives to us in here. This is a point, and this is part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. God... There are certain things that he gives to us, and there are certain things that God gives to us, but are never ours to possess. One of them is marriage. God never allows us to possess marriage. It's something that belongs to him, that we are permitted by vocation and by grace to enter into. But it's never our possession. And so it is ourselves with our life. My life does not belong to me. It belongs to God. And so while I'm responsible for my life, I can't do anything I want with it because even though God gives it to me, he didn't give it to me to possess. He gave it to me to live and to glorify him. So there are certain parts of creation which God never gives over. He gives to us as far as relationship. He gives to us as far as allowing us to participate but he never gives it to possess. And our life, our own life is one of them. And so he says, don't swear by your head because it's mine. It's not yours. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. When we go back to the beginning, I'm not gonna cover the middle part because that's more than a homily's worth, but we go back to the beginning where he talks about do not kill. He says, Whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And this isn't just, oh, I got upset at my brother. This is that I'm harboring resentment, that I'm holding on to anger against somebody. Now, anger isn't always bad. Jesus got angry, and then Jesus got over it, <laughs> right? He didn't hang on to anger. So well, petty anger is, I'm upset, I'm angry because I didn't get my way or because I don't like the way things are going, or I don't think it's fair, right? I'm angry because of that. Well, I need to grow up, right? And just get over it. But if I'm angry because there is some injustice in front of me that God says is an injustice, and I get angry at that, that's called righteous anger. 
So what do we do with that? We follow Jesus' model. We act on it in an appropriate way, and then we let it go. Scripture tells us, be angry. That's a command. Be angry, but do not let the sun go down on your anger. So appropriately express your anger, and then let it go. A lot of times we try to let anger go before it's appropriately expressed. And it's my experience that that's hard to do. So a lot of times we're trying to let go of anger and we can't let go of it. It's still sticking around. And part of the reason is because often we didn't express it appropriately in the first place. Anger is power or energy given to us by that emotion in order to overcome the obstacles that address address an injustice. So anger is given to me as an energy to overcome the obstacles that would prevent me from addressing an injustice. And so if there is an injustice by God's command, if it's God's command or God's right and wrong that is being violated and not just my preference, and I'm angry at that, that's a righteous anger that I express appropriately to the right person, right? If I'm, if I'm angry at my sister and I go and talk to my cousin about it and tell my cousin all about what I'm angry about with my sister, is that appropriate? Now, it's called triangling, right? I I don't get to do that. I need to be able to express it to my sister in an appropriate way, right? Not that I'm angry at my sister, I'm not. I'm just using an example, but to be able to express it to her in an appropriate way, that it's not over the top. I'm not blaming. I'm not calling names, right? Jesus says, no, call it. Don't say raka. Don't say you fool. Even if I'm angry at my sister for a legitimate reason, I can't call her an idiot. I can't call her a fool. I have to recognize that she's created in the image of God. And then I must uh, speak to her to express the anger about the injustice that needs to be overcome. And then I can put it in God's hands. I could basically pray and say to God, okay, God, this injustice you allowed me to see, you gave me the grace of anger. I expressed it. I've done what I can do. But vengeance is not mine, revenge is not mine, and it's not my job to punish. So I've done my part, here you go. You take care of it. That is letting go of anger. And that's the, that's the right way to deal with it. So Jesus says, don't hang on to anger, don't harbor it, don't allow that resentment to grow. Instead, he says, if you hang on to that anger, it's just like killing, right? Because it can often end up there, or sometimes end up there. And then he says, don't say raka, right? Don't say you fool. Don't say you idiot or you fool. When we get angry at somebody, what are we tempted to do? Call them names. Of course, we never do that today, do we? We're beyond that in the modern world, right? Especially in politics. We're all nice now and everything. Or in family. We call people names. And really, it has to do with this. If my own head doesn't belong to me, then guess what? Your reputation doesn't belong to me either. Your head, your reputation doesn't belong to me either. And so I don't get to deface it because you're created in the image of God. I might need to express something to you that's uncomfortable, that's inconvenient, that you don't like or that I don't like, but I don't get to call you names because your identity doesn't belong to me. It's not mine to manipulate. It ultimately belongs to God. And it's something that both you and I need to respect. Therefore, whether in marriage or in family, whether among rivals, we don't get to call each other an idiot or a fool or whatever other name is there. Brothers and sisters do this, right? This is called the law of fair fighting. When you're fighting as siblings, parents and children, as spouses, as whatever. There's a lot of rules you follow, but the two big ones are this. Do not call each other a name. That's out of bounds. That's an unfair fight. You respect the other person while you fight with them. And then the other one is, you don't blame. Because if you're angry, what you think is wrong with the other person is kind of irrelevant. It's pretty irrelevant. And so you don't blame the other person when you're, when you're fighting. I tell this a lot of times to, because every, all of us, right, when we're young, we confess, 
Oh, I'm fighting with my brother and my sister, right? All of us do that. That's part of God's plan. That's how the family works. So I always say this to kids and even sometimes adults, right? Did your brother know you loved him when you were fighting with him? Or did he doubt your love? Did he doubt that he was safe around you? He says, no, my brother knows I love him. I says, okay, that's a reasonably fair fight. Just make sure you reconcile at the end of it and you'll be okay. <laughs> that's a fair fight, right? So the Lord says here, don't harbor that anger, that resentment. Don't break the rules. Protect the name and the, and the reputation, protect the name that God gave to that person. When you speak to them, when you treat to them, and as well, protect the name that God gave to you because you don't possess yourself, you don't possess the other person, these belong to God. And the Lord says, let that sink into your heart. This is how Jesus lives out in us a greater fulfillment of the law.